Hello, everybody. Welcome to Topics in Digital Law Practice, Week 6. My name is John Mayer, and I'm the Executive Director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. And so there isn't a uh, disembodied voice. That's me. Oops, I got Google. Uh, sorry, I got photobombed by Sarah, who was our speaker last week. I wanted to remind everybody that uh, there is no CLE credit offered for uh, this course. We have not made arrangements for that. Um, I understand that some states allow uh, self-reported um, uh, CLE credit. That's wonderful, but that's uh, entirely your uh, responsibility. The goals of this class, if you remember, are to give students, law students, access to the most up-to-date information about uh, changes happening in law practice. We also want to inform law faculty. There's quite a few law faculty registered for this class. Actually, there's over 870 people registered for this class. Not all of them are showing up every time we do the live version, but uh, quite a few people are are catching it on the uh, on the uh, on the TiVo, on the uh, record, and, and via our YouTube channel. But we want to inform also law faculty about the changing nature of law practice so that it informs their teaching. And we want to create uh, an enduring resource uh, for future classes. And I'm especially happy that we've done something, we've, we've hit that goal in a major way uh, with this last homework assignment, and I'll explain in a second. And so this is a MOOC. This is a massive online open course. Um, uh, maybe ma maybe massive is uh, a little bit uh, too much hyperbole, but it's uh, it's 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 pretty big. We've been seeing well over a hundred people coming live every time, and um, and about double that uh, watching the uh, videos. And so um, uh, I'm I'm ter terribly pleased with those numbers. So glad to have you. This is the websites that you need to know about, tdlp.classcaster.net. It's a blog. You can leave comments there. I probably should have made that uh, clear right from the start. Uh, ask questions. The uh, wikispaces.com website is where the homeworks are. The Twitter hashtag is TDLP. If you uh, tweet about this, um, you could also follow Cali Org or myself, John P. Mayer, on Twitter because whenever anything happens within the class, uh, that's where we will uh, make the first noise about it. So the reveal for the homework six badge is there it is. Homework 6, TDOP 86. I'll talk about that once uh, Kingsley's finished with his talk. And it's time to say congratulations to you, the class. If you remember, last week I, I gave the class a uh, an extra credit assignment, which was to, let me see if I can uh, pull it up here. There it is. To pull up, uh, to, to create a wiki page which has links to uh, primary legal research materials, cases, statutes, regulations by state for every state, and you did it. Every one of these states, including um, uh, American Samoa and some uh, outside the U.S. Uh, uh, links have been added, are all available now on one, uh, one giant, well, one pretty darn big uh, wiki page. Great work. That means you all get a badge. And what that means is I went, I've gone in and added a, uh, the extra credit badge for everybody's, um, uh, homework wiki or homework page, um, all the way, all the way down the line. So even if you haven't done very much other homework, um, or if you've done all the other homeworks, you, you, by, by virtue of being part of the class, um, uh, you got this badge. Congratulations. And especially thank you to the people who, uh, who did the work of doing that. It wasn't just one or two. There was about a, a dozen or two who did a, who did the work there. Uh, really appreciate you contributing to, for the benefit of the entire class. All right. So let's get going with week six. Don't forget, if you have questions, drop them into the question box. We will try to answer them after uh, Kingsley has finished speaking. And those that we don't, we, we drop into the homework wiki uh, space, and then we, we, we try to get him to answer them after the fact. Um, this week, our speaker is Kingsley Martin on the topic of contract standardization. Kingsley, we, we can't be more lucky to get Kingsley to speak. He's, he's, he's one of those rare birds. There's actually a lot of people that do this type of work. Uh, knowledge management, creation, um, think about automating, automation of contracts and things like that. 
but but Kingsley is the rare one that talks about what he does in a very public manner and creates and has a has a fantastic blog and and has a website where where you can learn a lot about this sort of back office and yet vital process that that's that's deep and intellectual and important and i believe that it's going to going to become sort of the bulwark of of uh, the future of a lot of law practice um and so having somebody like Kingsley to be able to speak about it is is not only um unusual and rare but it's uh but but i think tremendously valuable um i wanted to point out that on 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 the bio on his uh um Blog. He's the owner of the, the software company Kayak, uh, developing software to automatically create market standards, standards for legal agreements and desktop review tool to compare legal agreements to such market norms. That all, that, that sounds rather wonky, Kingsley. I'll, I'll say that. But when you get into it, it's, it's fantastically interesting. Um, and myself as an engineer, I, I see this as, as absolutely something that law faculty and law students, um, should understand a lot more. So with that, we'll uh, ask uh, Sarah or Austin to turn the screen over to Kingsley and, and let him get started. Thank you, John. Thank you for the introduction. I must go look at that wonky um, description. <laughs> <laughs> let me just give you a little bit of introduction about myself. Um, I am an ex-lawyer um, who practice in the traditional large law firms but found myself deeply interested in technology relatively early on and many, many years ago uh, taught myself computer programming and developed some of the first document assembly programs. Uh, but that passion about uh, working particularly with contracts and transactional practice has never left me. And so four years ago, I formed the company Kayak to be able to do a lot of what I was doing previously manually, just sitting down and reading large stacks of contracts in order to be able to come up with model forms and document assembly systems and automate it. So that's what we're going to focus on today is the two sides of, of the business, which is contract analysis, the ability to automatically review legal agreements, and from that, the ability to create contract standards. I thought I'd start with a little bit of an introduction that as more and more as I look and analyze many different types of legal agreements, in many ways what I'm beginning to see now is that as a practitioner, I used to focus on the glory details, the actual words, down to the details of the will, shall, and must, and often getting so sort of enmeshed in it, it was hard to see the parallels and consistencies the, that we can see from one contract type to another. And today, I can, using tools like this, it's almost being able to see the forest for the trees. And looking at most agreement types, you can see them fall into three major categories. They're purchase agreements, where we're buying something. License agreements, where we're using something. It could be a license of intellectual property. It could be a use of money or a loan. It could be a use of property or a lease. Or you might have performance agreements, such as employment agreement, contractor, independent contract agreement, and so on and so forth. All of these, when you start to analyze them, you begin to see that they share common characteristics. And more and more, I look at these documents and see that there's really a recipe for building it. It's really a recipe for essentially creating a business transaction. And we can see the commonality not only um, within documents in a law firm, but we can see them nationally. And indeed, I've done analysis of things like in user license agreements, and you can see the similarities globally. It's not surprising to me in, in some ways that the concept of an indemnity is no different in Germany, Switzerland, or Japan as it is here. And I'm actually wondering in the bigger scheme of things whether this is potentially a, a large export of uh, essentially Anglo-American know-how to the developing world through such contract standards. It is fundamentally the language of business. But one of the things that we'll sort of dig into here and we'll see is there's an, in some interesting ironies in the marketplace right now. That as I run this analysis, I can make a 
very strange statement, which is true, that the more complex the transaction, the more standard the deal today. A merger agreement is a much more consistent document than an employment agreement. And we can dig in and, um, and sort of find out why. But from a legal viewpoint, as I said, there is a consistent pattern. When you look at bilateral exchange agreements, whether they be a purchase, a license, or a performance, they have the same building blocks to them. And we can see these shared across many documents. And it's really actually very interesting to compare and contrast one document type to another to see what they have or don't have. So an interesting irony, and I, I love looking at these documents and seeing some of the sort of the more bizarre circumstances out of it, that if you look at a merger agreement, and I was just analyzing a large set, if you, in, in the merger agreement, you will find a representation uh, in some documents, usually only about 10% of them, that is a representation that, that specifies what debt you carry, what loans you currently have outstanding, you only, in the merger agreement, you only see in about 10, maybe 20%. But if you look at that same representation in a loan agreement or credit agreement, you'll find that, that clause in every single one. So I ask my you know, practicing friends and say, well, is this true then? If I am if I'm loaning you money, I will always want to know about your other debt. But if I buy your company, I don't care. No, I think it isn't true. I mean, that's, obviously, we do care about uh, outstanding debt. It's just that we've never really seen these things at a higher level to be able to see the conformity and the consistency across one document type to another. The other piece of the puzzle, so, and then most practitioners get a sense of this as you are drafting documents. There's a lot of similarity from one to another. And of course, we're constantly reusing, repurposing one agreement to the next as the basis for our next, next document. From a technology viewpoint, the document structure is also very consistent. And this is actually an image taken from our patent. So when we look at and analyze each of these documents, what we do is we decompose them into their structural hierarchy. And in most cases, legal agreements have a structure and a hierarchy that, it, like what you see on the screen, that allows us to compare each of these to any other document no matter how they're captioned, no matter how they're organized. And this is really the basis then of the technology, is to combine the fact that we see consistent language and consistent structure, and what it allows us to create then is a contract analysis engine. This engine that we built, and I'll show you, I'll, I'll do most of this through demonstrations. Uh, the engine was built because what I used to do manually is essentially go to a law firm, a practice group within it, and if we were to standardize, say, a will or a merger agreement, typically what we would do is we'd ask them for samples of their best forms and their exemplars. And in many cases, this would generate a stack of enormous stack of paper. So, for example, if we were to try and create an analysis of a merger agreement, I would typically ask for at least 50. I think of it as a statistically relevant set. It's a set of documents that covers a wide enough set of deal circumstance that I know that I've got all the range of options in there. Same kind of uh, analysis that you might do, for example, to say, how many people do I have to ask how they're going to vote in a presidential election in order to be able to get an accurate, accurate, an accurate prediction? I don't have to ask everyone. And my sense today is that, in general, I need about 50 of an agreement type. We can use a lot less if they're very consistent, or we might need more if they're longer. But if they were, say, 50, and they're a merger agreement, then typically they're around 75 pages. So that means I'd have to sit down and read 3,750 pages, or over three times the length of War and Peace, many, many times in order to create a model. And the way I would do it manually is the same way that we programmed it. The manual technique, I usually scan the pile and pull the fattest document from the pile, and I write down the names of all the clauses into a database. Then I would serially go through the pile, looking at each of the documents, adding the names of clauses I hadn't seen before. Then I would organize those, uh, that outline into some kind of checklist, and then go through the pile many, many times again, often laying the documents out on the floor in order to create the standard language of all of those clauses. And it literally could take months. 
Kayak, the software, can do 50 merge agreements in less than a minute. What it will do is it will take those documents, analyze them, tell you how they're organized, create that checklist. It will find all the clauses in there. It will create that clause library. And it will find the range of standard and non-standard language across the set. Let me just give you a little bit of a sort of a pictorial of those main pieces, and then I'll show it to you live. So the first thing that we do is we take, say, the 50 merge agreements, and we aggregate those, those all, all of the elements of those documents into one common outline. And what you're seeing here is the outline or table of contents of an aggregated merge agreement. And here are all of the captions that we typically see, including all the sub-elements. And to the left of each of the captions, you have an icon here that indicates how frequently we see that particular clause. The more filled in or more blue it is, the more frequently that, that clause occurs. So not surprisingly, in a merger agreement, we see the merger clause in every single one, no matter, by the way, how it is titled. And when I look at something like this now, I can take a look now and create essentially a checklist of a merger agreement. And where you see this pie filled in, or it is mostly filled in, you can in essence think of that as a required provision. Where it is less filled in, we only see, for example, this offer clause in about 20%, then it is presumably optional and, and, and exists in certain circumstances. And in this particular case, the offer clause is used where the deal is structured as a tender offer to purchase the stock of a public company. And that's not always the case. We only see that in about 20%. So it becomes, for me, a really good learning tool to understand what are the elements of any particular deal type. In fact, I distinctly recall my very first assignment as a young associate in the United States, which was to draft a credit agreement. An incredibly complicated document, and you know, having just graduated from two different law schools, I literally could not complete my first assignment. I had to do it the old-fashioned way, like, like everyone else, sit down and read these things to be able to understand what was in them and make sure that I had all the right language. And in fact, I would go so far today to say that while we have focused a lot on clause libraries in the past, this may be more important, the checklist. Because these are, these are very complicated documents. And for the most part, the practitioners are just working off a typical Word document, and they're trying to keep in their head all of the provisions in the document. And it kind of reminds me, I don't know if you are familiar with a book written by a surgeon called Atel Gawande. He's a surgeon operating in the OR, and he was trying to get his fellow surgeons to work off a relatively simple checklist. But of course, like lawyers, they were much too smart to use a checklist. Nonetheless, he said, indulge me. And he, they, they ran some tests, both in developing and developed countries, and they found that the use of this checklist reduced complications from OR by one third. And not surprisingly, we can find the same things in, in, in legal agreements. I will frequently find situations where a clause that appears in virtually every document because it is in essence required is missing. Because it's really hard, not only is it, it's hard enough to prove what's in front of you, how do you keep track of what's not there? Or I see the opposite sometimes, in which a clause appears twice in a single document. And sometimes it says different things. In fact, I think you're probably better off missing it than duplicating it and saying different things. We can also begin to test some of the logic in here. So, for example, in that instance of where we see the offer clause, we can ask the software and say, well, where we see that clause, show me all the other clauses that appear or don't appear because of the presence of that clause. Show me any contingent relationships between the, 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 the structure of this document. And what you will find in this particular case is that there is an inverse relationship between the offer clause and the identification clause. If I see one, I won't see the other. And the reason is actually for, for good business reasons. If I see the offer clause, this is indicates that it is an offer to purchase the stock of a public company. And the selling shareholders, they may be you and I, you know, we may only have own one or two shares. We're not about to indemnify Megabucks Corporation buying this thing. On the other hand, 
if I'm buying a private company, I'm almost always going to ask for some kind of indemnification. But if that's the case, I won't see the offer. So you really have a very good tool to be able to essentially analyze the component and structure of these documents and then compare and analyze them and say, is this different jurisdictionally? Is this different because of different consideration? Is it different because of the nature of the assets? So in addition to the checklist, we also create the clause library. And the main thing that we are seeking to do in this circumstance is identify the core language. Now what we used to do in the past as KM folks inside of law firms is that we would attempt to find the core language by seeking to take the clauses from the first drafts of legal agreements on the hope that in the early stages of drafting before it had been negotiated and changed between the parties, it contained that core language. But in truth, that never would have worked, or at least not reliably because we're always copying and reusing documents. So in all likelihood, the language from the so-called first draft would have been drawn from the language of the last draft of the document that it was copied from. So we solve this problem programmatically. The way we go about it is this. To find the core pre-negotiated language, the first step is to find all the governing law clauses. Then we analyze each of those clauses and find all the common terms in those clauses. Those are shown in green here. And of course, by contrast, we can find the divergent or deal-specific language, which is shown as black and underlined. And then programmatically, we can find the clause that contains the most common language and the least divergent language. And voila, you will have the core language. Then secondly, having done that, we then organize all of the clauses so that like-kind clauses appear next to one another. And we organize it in a pattern whereby, as you move up in this particular collection, you will see clauses that are more divergent. And by this icon here, the green-red icon, what you see is an analysis of consistency. And it's set up on something like a standard distribution curve, so that as you go up, you see the clauses that contain the standard language, but increasing amounts of deal-specific or divergent language. And as you move down, you see the clauses that may be missing some of the key terms. And so finally, what we do then is we set up a slider bar that allows us to be able to see these clauses in terms of their conformity. And in the green area here, what we see are the clauses that contain are consistent, containing that core language, and the clauses out here will be the clauses that contain the standard language but increasing amounts of deal specific or divergent language. And it's a very quick visual to say how consistent these clauses are across the set. The wider that green area, the more consistent and conforming the clauses. The narrower it is, the more divergent they are. So one of the interesting ones I was able to do uh, recently was speak to an entire partnership of 500 partners at a law, very large law firm and they had just prior to this presentation had given me a set of the executive employment agreements. And I picked on one of the clauses called the severability clause because it just struck me how wildly different every single clause was across the set. I don't know if this has been mentioned in, uh, in previous classes, but one of the seminal works in this area is a book by Richard Susskind called The End of Lawyers? And what he, one of his main thesis in the book is that we are very likely to move from a highly customized world where we hand draft and tweak every document to more of a standards based world as a step on the way to full automation. So looking at the consistency and the degree of standards um, is a good measure of whether we are essentially moving to more of an assembly line creation of contracts. And in most cases, you can look at these clauses and see whether they are substantive differences or semantic differences. In this particular case, I was able to show the partnership that virtually every clause, every single severability clause was different. I mean, I had to say to them, and I know this is wise to do in front of the full partnership, is that it's almost as if you approach it like a novel because these clauses were that different and that creative. But seriously, though, if you look at those clauses and analyze them, what you find is that 100% of them have the language of severance, 
which basically says that if any clause in this agreement is found to be illegal or unenforceable, then the rest of the document will stand. But only about 16% of them have the language of reformation, which says that if a provision is too egregious, as you might say, a non-compete uh, term for five years, the court, if you put in the language of reformation, can scale that back to what is reasonable. Under severance, you would only, you would essentially have it or lose it. And since the firm mostly represented large corporations, and probably the corporation and not the executive, then most of their documents were not protecting them appropriately. So let me just give you uh, a quick demonstration of this live, and I'm going to use a site that I recently built uh, for the Association of Corporate Counsel. This is a, uh, a membership group uh, with of 30,000 general counsel, or nearly 30,000, and the idea here is that the membership, the general counsel of many large and smaller businesses around the world, will contribute their forms uh, to our system and we will create standards for the ACC. In all honesty, many of these corporations have been asking their law firms for years for forms and standards, and they have not received them. So they're essentially taking matters into their own hands and building a peer standard for documents. And right now, we have, and now we're live, we have uh, 10 documents that we are launching with, and we will be adding multiple documents um, over the course of the next few weeks and months. So in this environment here, you're going to see now um, the environment now built in a, a dynamic manner. So let's just start with an executive employment agreement. And what you see here then is we put in the middle panel here the form document that we have built from the analysis. So bear in mind, unlike in my, my previous life where I used to do this manually, I can now very quickly say what are the elements of this document, and I can very quickly determine what is, what is the standard language of any of these clauses. And so I can typically build a form like this, not in months, but sometimes in minutes. And in, each, in here what you see then is the structure of the employment agreement, and again the icon that indicates how frequently we see the clauses. And these, are, these come from a number um, of different uh, businesses. So it doesn't surprise me that we don't see as much consistency as I would typically see um, in a, well, say, like a merger agreement from a single entity. But nonetheless, in here, you can see, for example, in the compensation area, it's pretty easy to see that the standard components of compensation are based salary and bonus, benefits and vacations. And stock options don't appear as often. Again, this is just an example of a clause that is used in certain circumstance, and probably the circumstance that you would grant options or equity is for founder um, or very high level employees. And same with automobile. So when we click on, let's just start fairly simply. Let's just go into the miscellaneous clauses and start with a fairly simple one, the governing law clause. When you click on this clause, the program goes out and it finds that standard language, the clause that contains the most common terms, they're shown in green, and the least divergent terms, which is shown as black and underlined. So it's very easy for me, if I'm going to build a form, I know this is a variable piece of information. Uh, just typically we'll put a, a bracket around that and just put in in all caps, governing law state. And you change that in your specific document. And once again, we can see the entire clause library here where you can see the range of conformity. Now when I'm, we're going to move in a second over to the contract standards piece. When I use this analysis to build a new standard uh, clause for a governing law, the way I do it is, is, is frankly quite mechanical and, and can be taught very quickly. It's a three-step process. Step one, I understand what is the core language of the clause, typically by clicking around this core area here and seeing, essentially here I see obviously the variable is the state, but as I go to this next one, what I'm looking for is the elements of this clause. And often you see them broken down either by periods, or in this case uh, it's a subclause, that there are two elements to this clause. This agreement shall be governed by the laws of the state 
of Colorado without regard to conflicts. So I know pretty quickly then what is the standard language of this clause and the elements of it. Step two, I will then go up to the top of the list where I want to see clauses that may contain more elements because one of the characteristics of clauses at this end is they tend to have more deal specific information in it. They tend to be longer or they tend to be really divergent. But what I'm looking for in here is these other elements. Like this one is, this is talking about all questions with respect to the construction of this reason. By the way, I hate that one. I mean, that's just almost silly. Um, it's just not about someone raising a question saying, I've got a question about this. It's about the adjudication and enforcement of this. So again, here, we're, here I see one from England, um, but this additional language here, which you all see is all underlined, if you look at it, it's very likely to be the language of jurisdiction and venue, which we've broken out as a separate clause. So having found the elements, my third step is I tend to go to the other end of the, um, the list and see if I can find those elements written in a more concise manner. And here we see another English clause. And often this is the case that lying out on the edges here are going to be the outliers. England, Hong Kong, and here we see essentially the, the US ones, but in a much more abbreviated firm, form. But in this case, because it's missing the, the language of, of complex. So what we can do then with this um, is we can build uh, new forms extremely quickly. Um, or we can compare any document to the standard. So maybe what I'll do here, I'm going to show you those two pieces really fast. So I'm first of all going to go to another demonstra demonstration site here, and I want to bring up an asset purchase agreement. This was taken from a very large US law firm. We used 250 documents to build this, in part because they were trying to find consensus. And in the past, the firm had tried to build a new model through the old-fashioned technique of committee. And not surprisingly, they got nowhere. I mean, I've had examples where I've worked with lawyers inside of the law firms where after multiple meetings, we were still hashing out the gory details of the numbering scheme and the font. We hadn't got to any of the substance. <laughs> and a lot of drafting pride is involved here. So the way we actually do it is this. So we can look at this document and we can quickly find all of the elements of this document and we can quickly find the standard language of any of the clauses. But the problem is we could have taken this clause from any one of the 250 documents. So we'd have to go through very carefully and make sure that all of our clause language was consistent. But there's a much faster way. First, I'm going to turn on the ability to edit this document. I go to the source documents. And just as we analyze it, it, the clauses for consistency, so we can analyze the entire document. So a quick way to do this would be to, first of all, find the most conforming document in the firm. It's this one. We have now established that there is a de facto standard of an asset purchase agreement at this firm. And we can see that this is a very good starting point. And you can show the partners at this firm that that standard is used widely. So I can now build my new form based upon this. I can then go to the outline, and I can ask, I can ask essentially, well, if I use this as a starting point, is there anything missing? Well, I can do that by highlighting the clauses from the selected document, and it has everything, but it's missing a tax matters clause. I can click on that clause, and I can find the most standard clause of that and choose it for output. Secondly, I can look at all of the clauses in that starting point document and analyze every one of them and ask the program and say, are they all good ones? Are there any that are really different from the standard? And I can use this function here to highlight them. And in the case of this will become clear in the purchase price, what we end up with here is that this is the clause that we picked from the base document, but this is the clause that the program would have otherwise picked. And it's asking you, do you want to replace it with this one? Well, quick look at it shows that this one here contains a purchase price and assumption of liabilities, whereas the one from the form document, in addition, has an optional escrow. So we use this one. And in a few minutes, this, this form was actually created in an hour. We go through each of those divergent ones. We can then turn on the document assembly capacity, assemble the document, and here is my new form. It tells you where this document came from. And we can then go through and essentially conform the language. 
but this, this is a Word document, but it's automatically linked back into the clause library. So I can just click on that document and load up the system and take you to the exact set of clauses. And you can take a look and maybe replace that one with another one. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go something even more spectacular then. So people have been able to create forms before. But what happens if you didn't if your job is not to draft the document, the other side did it, and you would like to know how it stacks up against yours? So why don't we just do a, a real test in here? We'll just go out to Google. And let's just say that we're going to bring, you know, open an employment agreement. So this is not in the system. Here's that employment agreement. And I'd like to know, how does this stack up to my standard? So I've just taken the text of that document and I've copied it. And I'm going to go to our benchmark function and just paste in the text of my document. And I'm going to create interactive web pages from this. Click on it. It's done the analysis. Here is the analysis of my document compared to it, and we color code these things. So where it's in black, we found that clause, and we show you that from that Google document, it's pretty consistent. And you can bring the clause up and compare it side by side. But you notice also that there's a clause like this one here, position and employment period. Well, in the Google document, it's combined two clauses, the position with the employment term. So we can click on that clause, and it shows you the clause in here, but you can now search the template for the best matches. And it's going to show you, well, the best match we found is employment. Would you like to set the match to this? Do you want to override the program or give it some help? You just set the match to it, it's now matched. Same with competing business. We can find the best match for that, and it's saying non-competition. The reason why I didn't match this one is that it's kind of it's got a bit of elements of non-competition and non-solicitation. So I'm going to say match it to this. My outline is done. I can then regenerate this outline, and finally, for those who don't want to work online, we can generate a word report. And here is your one-to-many analysis that shows you that document, what you might be missing, all of the clauses black-lined against it, and again, hypertext linked back into the collection. Double woe. <laughs> so in the past, what, you, what technology has been able to do is you can do a one-to-one -one comparison, document comparison, but it only really works where the two compared documents are very similar versions of one another. It doesn't work if you're comparing two different employment agreements. It would just simply say one is a replacement of the other. So here you see for the first time a one-to-many and a many-to-many one, many -many comparison. So back to the uh, sort of uh, new technology, essentially, to be able to uh, more efficiently draft and review documents. But I want to show you, too, is that uh, one other piece that, uh, that we do in this area is I use all of this and I feed it into a open, public, free website, which is called contractstandards.com. And this is built apart of, of the, 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 the framework that you have seen. And so it's built off the, this, what I call the unified contract structure. So you see the elements um, of the agreement. I sort of started to sort of color code them. And for each one of these, you can drill down into um, the general provisions, for example. And I give you essentially the standard language of each of them. But if you'd like to drill in a bit more, then there is detail on all of these clauses that gives you a definition, it gives you the standard language, alternatives, and a discussion around it. And that's really where one of the pieces that you know I would very much be interested in, in doing, which is uh, this is a uh, sort of a combined effort of trying to, you know, primarily myself, but I do have others working on it. Um, and I just have, uh, as I said at the bottom of this, you have an open invitation to join me. Um, this website combines not only a standard clause language, but I'm also making freely available uh, contract automation tools, document assembly tools uh, built inside of Microsoft Word um, using the Visual Basic for Application program, which will automatically uh, essentially identify and fill in the blanks um, of, of any document. So like a generic, very simple document assembly program. So I see that I'm coming close 
um, to my time here. Um, so, John, is there one, or uh, Sarah, are there questions that I can address? Oh, you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, w- that was wonderful. We're going to pull the screen over to the uh, Google Doc where we've been, uh, I've been, I've been typing a bunch of questions and, um, uh, Sarah and Austin have been pulling the questions from the chat box. Um, so why don't we, why don't we just start at the top? Although I think the first few are mine. I feel, I feel uh, a little guilty, but they were popping into my head as you were talking. Um, the first one there, uh, uh KM and law firms, it went through a, a period of, you know, great popularity. I remember back in the, yeah. Uh, maybe late '90s, you know, but it seems to have faded. You know, are we, so are we? Are we coming back around to that, but in a, you know, with a different approach, a more bottom-up approach? I think so. I mean, I, I really do believe this. I mean, I've always been an advocate. There's, there's been two major directions um, of KM. One is sort of process-based, and one is technology-based. And the process base has been tri- primarily focused on seeing if you can get lawyers to collaborate and share. Uh-huh. Well, that's a really that's a really hard thing to do. Um, <laughs> I, I, I could put that in so many different ways, but it's what, why? Thing. Why is that? I mean, I, I run into the uh, similar problems in dealing with uh, law faculty, getting them to to, to share. I mean, they, yeah. they they won't they won't ever say we don't want to share. It's just that it's just that we, we can't seem to make the barriers low enough. Um, or the technology is simple enough to, to make it happen? I think quite fundamentally, there, be, there is no incentive to share, and there's plenty of disincentive not to, not to share with others right now. True. Um, I True. think if we uh, really do move to fixed fees, where you know, costs are essentially like any other business, that your profit is based upon the difference between your price and your cost of goods or services sold, then I think we will see this. And that's kind of what I'm seeing in, in our clients is that there is a growing interest and a growing awareness um, that something will need to be done to essentially become both more efficient, but I think standards also introduce quality too. Mm-hmm. And the bottom line is, I mean, this was it's a really painful hard thing to do. I mean, if every single document that you have would take one to three months, you just weren't going to do it. So they simply had to wait until technology uh, arrives to be able to have time. Is there, uh, well, when, when, uh, let, let's go, just go to the next question. Um, yeah. When you say recipe, I hear algorithm or flowchart, you know. Mm-hmm. How, how much computer science uh, do law students have to understand to, uh, to handle, you know, modern techno law practice? Well, I think it's an interesting, I'll answer that in an interesting I think for many people, you can still get away with very limited, but clearly the opportunities are in the area where there is a lot of technical skills. So, mm-hmm. for example, in, you know, when we're training people to use the software to build templates, I, mean, I look at it and say that I can teach a lawyer a little bit about technology, but it's probably unlikely that I can teach a technologist a little bit about the practice of law. <laughs> and sure, sure. Impossible. It takes it takes a few years. So, um, but there's a great opportunity in here, and that one of the possibilities going forward is that in the past, particularly the larger law firms, they have focused on very high priced, very high margin work, but it's also really low volume, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of pressure. In, in law firms to reduce that margin. Well, actually, everything that I've seen in the technology world is about volume. And I think that's partly what we're going to see. So one of the, there's enormous opportunity here for the technology-driven practice that if you look at the number of contracts that are drafted, I would say a small percentage of documents, contracts are drafted by lawyers in private practice. More are drafted by in-house counsel, but by far the majority are drafted by non-lawyers. Reduce the price, and as probably Richard pointed out, Richard Granite spoke in his presentation, that there is a colossal latent market out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a huge opportunity. So just like all things when we see change, the opportunity is not in, not in the traditional areas, it's in new areas that we are, we, we've yet to explore. Wow. Well, 
So you, you must have heard about the recent uh, copyright lawsuits about the lawyers who yeah. were upset that Lexus and Westlaw were scraping things from Pacer and reselling them. Isn't that going to cause trouble with people wanting to standardize contracts because people will be claiming ownership over individual yeah. clauses or something? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it sometimes does come up. And uh, the sort of the authoritative source, as far as I'm concerned, on the question of are legal agreements or briefs copyrightable, is actually Nimmer on contracts. And he says that a brief or agreement is copyrightable just like any other written work is copyrightable if it's a unique piece, if, it's, if it is an original work. And of course, I can demonstrably show that it's not. <laughs> right. The only thing unique is the name and the date or yeah. something like that. <laughs> but, but a smart lawyer can push back and say, OK, even if it's not unique, in terms of the uh, clauses, it is a unique compilation. Even though the individual pieces oh, sure, sure. may be uh, taken from other documents, uh, the way I put them together is a, compila is a unique compilation. Well, again, I can demonstrate that it's not. Um, in fact, I've had some, some, some fun ones in this area, because we can actually almost test the DNA. We can find, essentially, we can, we can trace the precedents back and see where they came from. Oh, how interesting, yeah. yes. So, I mean, for example, working with the ABA um, on a intellectual property security agreement, I can trace the precedents back into three main lines. That one of them goes back into the Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> so, so every every uh, legal document has already been written. Um, oh, I think there are. Everything is derivative from now on. <laughs> possibly, but I mean, there are there, there are circumstances. Um, sure. There are, very rare ones. Um, I think that the master agreement that was written for um, oh, the, the credit default rate swaps <laughs> that brought us the credit crisis. I mean, sure. that was that was really created um, by Alan Overy. They probably could have, but did not uh, copyright it. <laughs> now, the interesting irony here is that I think that the the analysis this this digital profile that we're building of these documents probably is copyrightable. That template I showed you uh -huh. is, is, a, is, a, is a creative book. Gotcha. I see. I see. <laughs> so if we're, if we're moving to an assembly line of contracts, um, what does that mean for the lawyer job market? We, do we need fewer lawyers because we're going to automate them out of their jobs? Possibly, but not necessarily. I think we're seeing just a shift here that um, I mean, what we are seeing is certain aspects of the practice are being automated, uh, and it's particularly the production. I think probably the best way to sort of explain, the, or at least my, my thoughts on this one, is what we have done is we, we're, we're going to automate what is truly mechanical and repeatable, but what is left is still the meaningful, loyally work. And it's probably more valuable because of it when you're actually thinking about architecting and negotiating a particular contract as opposed to drafting it. So I think a good analogy is if we go back and compare it to architecture, that when Frank Lloyd Wright um, designed Falling Water, there was absolutely no difference between his work in designing the, the building and creating the working drawings. They were all in the same, just as we architect a merger agreement through drafting the document. But today, in a modern architectural practice, of course, the, the working drawings are done through uh, computer-aided drafting tools. Sure. Really sophisticated tools like Rivet that not only create um, the, uh, the building, but can actually order what you need. Um, I think that's what we'll see. In, the, in architecture, when they were one and the same, you got the same price for it. Today, the profit margins on working drawings is maybe 2 or 3%. Mm-hmm. We still have to do it, but it is low margin work. Gotcha. It, it right. that some firms might see it as an opportunity to go high volume. Small yeah, rise, rising water floats everybody's boat, potentially yep. here. Um, I remember back in, in 1983, uh, I got my first job writing COBOL, and I read an article in Computer World that said um, a brand new COBOL code generator was being released by some, by DEC or some big company. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, great, I'm in the, I got my first job and I'm already going to be automated out of it. Um, you know, li little did I know that, um, you know, just because you can automate something doesn't mean that the people then 
that, that the people sit on top of that automation and do more or better or different work, like you just described. I think the other thing, too, an interesting volume area is, I, mean, I used to work for Thomson Reuters in Switzerland, and we were often, more often handling portfolios of documents, not just one. And I think that's one of the things that particularly general counsel wants is, what, what is the risk in these 6,000 sales agreements? When can I, when can I change the price? Where can I change the expense amounts? And so it's, it's the capacity to look at many will generate wholly new opportunities. It will actually see um, a role of, of, of contract analyst that will emerge. Sure. Sure, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. So is this only, though, for big law, big firms that can afford uh, this uh, expensive people like you or expensive software? Or is this is this actually so, going, to, going to be accessible, or is it accessible to solos and small firms? Well, it has to be said that, you know, as we developed it, I mean, the, the, the software costs are, are high, and the, uh, the the training costs are still a bit high on uh, on building, say, a merger agreement. Uh -huh. So, for the most part, in terms of private collections, they typically are by the you know, by the, the larger law firms. But at the example of the ACC is a really good one that groups of, of a peer groups can get together, and in essence, what they're doing is they're spreading the costs of one across thirty thousand members, and so it's sure. one thirty thousandth of the cost. So it that's one way to to make it more available. But as you can see. I've always uh, been interested in uh, sharing this, and so contract standards is always will always be free. Uh, I will probably add some uh, premium services to it in time to try and defray the cost of it, but in general it's going to be affordable to everyone. The second piece of it is that I think the way to get to really smart computer systems is we're building a bigger and bigger database of essentially the digital profiles of documents. And at some point, when we're able to run it, say, against the entire Edgar collection, then it will start to have the smarts to be able to add any legal agreement without training. At that point, our marginal costs rapidly fall. And therefore, we can make it more broadly available. Well, when I was watching what you were doing, I was thinking, when is Google going to buy you? And then, and then, when is Google going to just then go scrape Pacer and you know make make what you just did sort of generally available to everybody? Because it just seemed like it, that would be uh, a fascinating thing to do. Maybe it's somebody's I don't twenty percent. Uh, if, if Google would ever be interested in a vertical market, I know we think that the legal market is large, but from a Google's perspective, I don't know if it's big enough. Well, it, 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 you, I guess the way I was thinking was mm -hmm. if somebody did that, then the, it would create new markets. Oh, I think it would be colossal. I mean, I honestly believe that. I mean, I, I watch the, um, the people that come to the contract standards website, and it is increasingly people from uh, the Far East and China because they, they probably don't have any sort of mechanism for how do you uh, license a piece of software? Um, how do you structure an asset purchase agreement? Sure. And since and the Anglo American system has refined commerce over almost a thousand years in these <laughs> uh, which, 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 which brings me to two, to, two questions mm -hmm. like that. Uh, how, how transferable is this in other languages besides English? Fundamentally, the technology is built upon a statistical analysis technique. A bit like um, Google's Translate, instead of trying to teach it the rules of essentially, you know, what is a clause, you essentially give it examples um, of what you're looking for, and it can match others. So given the fact that it is a statistical as opposed to a rules-based technique, it would work in any language. It just needs, we purposely built it so that it doesn't have any pre-configured uh, taxonomies or things that it looks for. It has to learn about the documents from themselves. There is just a small number of stop words that we add to it um, that we would, probably, we would need to translate into the other, uh, other languages. Mm -hmm. um, and we use what's known as a word universe to be able to uh, develop the base word weights. So we give it around a quarter million to half a million documents. 
and it learns every single word and how frequently they appear in it. So you can see, you can measure the, the distinguishing characteristic of any word. We'd have to build that in the foreign language too, but it, that is, again is, is not, a, not a big deal. So it actually could work uh, in any language. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't quite understand that question. I'm going to move on. Um, so, do you do you perform this for for clients, or do you uh, or do you hand off uh, your tool to firms and have the local IT people use Kayak? We can do either way. I mean, essentially, uh, there are firms that essentially want the software and they do it themselves, um, but they have to undertake the training necessary to build it. Uh, we offer as a service. Um, and, I, and I just think, in general, because we're good at it, and we, we're, we're probably fast to them, and in which case, we're probably cheaper than them. But nonetheless, there are firms that simply just want to do it themselves. Sure, sure. Um, and it's something that, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen um, some of the other questions, is that it is something that could be used in a law school. Yeah, that was my other one, right. So. Should law schools teach this in contracts, or is this too advanced? You know, do do students need first a a, a a deep grounding in the doctrine before they can even understand you know these meta issues that you're dealing with? No, I think so. I think it's uh, the same. I mean, my, my very I mean, most of your uh, attorneys are going to go out initially. They're either going to be or deal lawyers, and I think that law school provides them with a little bit of knowledge about the substance of substance of, uh, of litigation. But, but nothing about transactional practice. And it's not that difficult to teach. I think if you build it off, it, most of it, frankly, uh, is business common sense. Um, there are, of course, legal issues associated with certain elements of contracting. But to have a basic understanding of what is a, a, a bargain, not in the sense of you know what is concession, but really what are the elements of a deal, I think we're in general, help the students you know, take on their first assignments and learn more quickly. Um, and I think it would be a, a very good tool. Besides, the, the thing I often thought about, I've never been able to do this. Maybe there's someone on the, on the line here that would be interested in taking me up on this, but it would make a good law school class to be able to teach essentially the nature of contracts. But one of the advantages is the program has a built-in examination. We can benchmark the documents that the uh, that the students draft and give them immediate feedback. Oh, I see now. Yeah. So, but but they wouldn't be drafting the documents from scratch, or maybe they would. You have them write a write a bespoke, as Richard Susskind likes to say, a bespoke document, and then compare it to the uh, to the database. I think that's right. If you teach someone math, you wouldn't just give them a calculator. Uh huh. Fascinating. Fascinating. Right. And, well, the, the, other, the other thing that I found interesting about this was as you were analyzing or talking about analyzing um, uh, corpuses, uh, corpi, I'm not sure what the plural of corpus is, uh, g- groups of documents, I was thinking, you know, I, I do a lot of looking at uh, case books, you know, and after you've looked at two or three uh, case books, you know, they all sort of look alike. They all have uh, an overlap of cases of 50, 75, maybe 90%. Um, and th- although the commentary is different, it it naturally mm-hmm. follows what every contracts teacher thinks needs to be taught, and they're basing that on what they were taught when they went to law school, which was based on what they were taught when they went to law school, probably all the way back to, you know, mm-hmm. Elang, uh, Langdell. Um, and, and so the same, I'm imagining the same concepts being applied to the production of educational materials. You know, instead of the output being a contract, the output is a is a course pack. Well, I think there's two pieces to that. I mean, truly the reason why Google might be interested is that most search engines today only give you the whole, whereas most people just want the piece. The second piece that, as you're pointing out, is there are numerous documents that have sort of like a required pattern to them. I mean, what, what should be in the document? Um, and that is a uh, something that, for example, when I thought about, is you could take a look at um, all uh, regulations across the states and compare them and see what's similar and what's different. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes, yes. Where, where we could apply this to. Sure, and sure. We're just on, on transactional, but it is at its core a structural search engine. 
Sure. And then one, one, one quickie then, because I, I had an interesting, I was showing this to an attorney, and at the end of it said, well, would you, you know, run an analysis of a set of documents I'm going to give you? And he sent me a bunch of ethical guidelines and financial advisors. And I thought, oh, we were talking about legal agreements this whole time. And yeah, I looked at them, and most of them had a structure to them, you know, caption numbers. But a whole bunch of them didn't. I thought, damn, that's not going to very well. Because, I mean, very quickly, when you look at the power of a search engine, word search is maybe 20% accurate. Conceptual search, pure statistics, is about 40% accurate. But conceptual search is in the 90s accurate. And so when I looked at the documents that lacked the structure, they weren't going to be any more accurate than a Google could do, about a 40%. They had a structure to them, so I went back to Microsoft Word and just put on outline numbering, numbered them, and whammo, they became 90% accurate in matching them. So structure enormous amount to do with the accuracy of search engines. Well, that's that's amazing. So, so unfortunately, I've I've had, I've gone on a little bit too long, and and I need to make sure I give the students their uh, homework assignment. Um, thank you very much, Kingsley. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, really appreciate it. My so, folks, the homework assignment, um, we, we hope that you can apply what you've just learned a little bit. Um, what we want you to do is go out and find at least two uh, EULAs, uh, end-user license agreements, or two terms of service from any website, and this is the key, that has some aspect of user-contributed content. So something where you contribute a photo or, a, or the website you know, depends on uh, comments or uploading of pictures or something like that. We want you to find the clauses in those EULAs, just, just these clauses, that talk about the ownership or the license rights of that user-submitted content. In other words, ignore, you don't have to look, you don't have to read all 70 pages of Apple's um, EULA. You know, we're just looking for the, cl the couple of clauses that, that involve user-submitted content. Uh, copy those clauses, not the entire one into the homework wiki, and then, um, uh, and then read them and answer the following questions. Are there similar components between the two or more clauses, and how are they same, how are they different? In other words, uh, we want you to practice what uh, Kingsley's just talked about, that, that process of analyzing you know, a single clause. And then I want you to write a standard clause that uses the similar elements from the EULAs that you analyze. And for areas that are dissimilar, you know, include both options in parentheses. So, so the homework is find a couple of EULAs, Look for the user submitted content clauses, read them and understand the differences and similarities between those two clauses, and then and then combine them into a standard uh, clause for user submitted content. This is a this is a little tougher homework than we've given in the past, but um, we're six uh, classes into this, and we thought we should uh, do something that that gives you practice in what you just uh, saw. Um, don't forget to put a little dash six dash next to your name in the homework wiki. And I wanted to make sure that I covered everything. Yes, I have. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be posting the uh, video archive of this in a, in a couple of hours. And uh, see you all next week when uh, we've got uh, Ron Stout talking about um, access to justice, A to J author, and the use of online forms or automated forms in legal aid and don't be fooled by the fact that it's that it's about legal aid this is extremely relevant to to uh, everything that, that has come before document automation um, flowcharts algorithms uh, automated practice systems virtual lawyering um, and you're going to see a, a real live system that is in in use in, in a in a that has been used over a million times by uh, people who are representing themselves um, at legal aid websites. Um, and so it's going to be an excellent session. Thanks again and see you next week. The organizer has ended the session.